came here expecting an objective review, guess again. Today G.I. Joburg examines my favourite frogman of all time, Hydro Viper. I think this could quite possibly be the very first G.I. Joe figure I picked out and paid for with my own allowance. I was five years old, my weekly pocket money was a very respectable 10 rand per week. To put that in perspective, it could stretch as far as a carded Joe, a glass bottle of Coca-Cola, and a packet of the greatest potato chip brand to have ever existed, O'Grady's. I think I can recall picking up a carded falcon and immediately disregarding him as green and boring. That was precisely the way the kids of the 90s had been programmed, I'll have you know. The more exotic the colour, the more enticing the toy. Looking at carded images of Hydra Viper now, I think I must have concluded that it was the card art that sold it to me. There's really nothing like it in all of Joe. Forget the freaks of Cobra Law and their unfortunately dumpy 3-pack art. The Hydro Viper art was truly monstrous. A chilling sight, and one that five-year-old Steve imagined the awkward purple toy rattling alongside could approximate if I only took him out of his package and equipped him with his abundant gear. Content with my selection, we proceeded to the checkout. The figure cost me 7 rands 98 cents. The balance went to my coke and chips. The fun didn't end there, as Dad suggested we go home via the local park where I could enjoy my loot in the morning sun and probably conduct Hydra Viper's first dive into the stream. I remember one or two fragments from that encounter, like feeding some of my chips to the bird life, but I had no memory of Hydra Viper's spear gun, hoses and knife, all of which must have been lost forever on opening that package. What I can recall is getting home that afternoon and using my safety scissors from preschool to cut out the file card, only to further examine the card art and wonder why I don't have the cool looking knife Hydro was brandishing in the picture. Oh well. To say I have nostalgia for this toy is the mother of all understatements. For much of my childhood, Hydro was the only Cobra figure to transcend being a pure villain and actually becoming a hero. I blame three things. One. An obsession with ninjas, anyone in a skin-tight outfit excelled at sneaking about and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Two, delight that, thanks to the expertly sculpted webbed hand, Hydra was a mutant. He could move at inhuman speeds through water. What else could he do? The mind races. And three, he had been sculpted with very sympathetic eyes. Possibly not intended, but nevertheless the result was a very troubled look that spoke more to a complexity of character than pure villainy. I addressed the further uses of my Hydra Viper in an early G.I. Joburg video, the link is in the description below. But today we're here to review Cobra's elite underwater trooper, the Demons of the Deep, Hydra Viper. Purple. It's a colour taken up by the Tele Viper in 1985 and was definitely in full swing as part of Cobra's palettes by 1988. Perhaps the move was further prompted by Destra's forces occupying the reds and blacks of the Cobra uniform and equipment. Do I like purple on Hydra Viper? If I'm honest, no, not really. In the translation of this character from concept to plastic, I think some of the elements have been lost, to the figure's detriment. The vest which appears black on the card has simply remained unpainted. The shade of purple, which had a deeper hue, closer to the Mumba attack helicopter and the aforesaid Tele Viper, has been pushed more into the realm of grape candy. But with the unpleasantness out of the way, it's time for the good. And the good is really good. Holy wow, my guys, that a cool mask. Jeepers. Lucky if we got a paint app on an accessory. Here we see two, and both purely decorative at that. I love it! very creature of the Black Lagoon, but also very special forces. These guys sit in a workshop and craft these custom masks to make their enemies shit their pants when they emerge from the water. It must be an incredibly unnerving sight. Extreme bonus points for the figure's eyes to be visible beneath the mask's eye slits. Nice sculpting there and great synergy between figure mold and accessory mold. Yank off the helmet and you reveal the blow up doll lips! No, really, it's a two-piece regulator that presumably hooks up to the air supply via the helmet. A little bit unpractical, but these guys are all style over substance anyway. The helmet fits surprisingly snugly for a hard plastic piece, as it makes friction with both the regulator at this point and at the back of the head, much to the detriment of the paintwork. 
final detail worth mentioning is the puckered ball sack texture of his hood. Nice touch. Keeps this guy feeling creepy and organic and monstrous, even down to the textures of his more mundane gear. More on that when we get to his fins. Hoo boy! Let's put that helmet back on. You've probably noticed by now that I'm refraining from using the standard black tubing Hydro Viper purportedly comes with. That was the first thing I lost on that fateful Saturday morning in the park. And the way I figure is, we didn't need it with Torpedo, we don't need it now. Look, the helmet is even sculpted to make the air hose integrated. And far less clunky than two moderately inflexible thick hoses that will snag on everything a reef or a wreck dive might present. On the back we have the air tanks. One large one, one medium sized one and one small one. What's that all about you ask? A main tank, a reserve tank and an emergency tank perhaps? Maybe. But I think this toy might be a representation of what divers refer to as trimix. For regular scuba at depths around 30 to 40 meters maximum, that's 100 to 130 feet, plain old compressed air is all you need. For deeper work, you need to more strictly regulate the exact types and quantity of gases that make up your breathing supply. The three main gases that make up trimix and their typical proportions for depths around 100 meters or 330 feet are oxygen at 10%, the small tank, nitrogen at 20%, the medium tank, and helium 70%, the large tank. These values are generalized and different mixes are optimal for different depths, so the Hydro Viper is presumably able to change the ratios while on the job instead of setting off with a pre-mixed tank. Hopefully the novelty is worth the added complexity it gives his gear, and I'd hate for a piece of equipment like this to fail at 150 meters below the surface. What is really cool is that the sculptors captured his various gauges on the tanks. This component would typically be run alongside and harnessed to his chest for a quick glance at the various pressures of the tanks, but it's nice to have it included anyways on the back of the accessory. The sculpt details at the top of the tanks is also excellent with no less than five additional gauges. Moving on to the figure's front, we see another authentic dive detail few contemporary Joe Frogman observe, the buoyancy control device or BCD. This nozzle allows the Hydro Viper to inflate or deflate the air bladders on his jacket to allow him to maintain a neutral buoyancy at various depths. Simple really, inflate the jacket to ascend, deflate the jacket by venting off air to descend. Find the balance between the two and hey presto, neutral buoyancy and you're staying right where you are. The other pipe I assume is a backup regulator for a buddy to share his air supply. Once again, a feature unmatched by any other frogman in the classic line. Or maybe I'm overthinking it and it's just a cool pipe that goes nowhere. <laughs> These two yellow details add a nice pop of color, but I have no idea what function they serve. They are pouches that are nicely visible to buddy divers who might need to get at his trail mix. Seafood flavor. The arms are packed with variation and interesting symmetry. The tampo on his right is not the typical Cobra symbol. Always seemed to me like they'd botched it. By 1988, Cobra was the masters of their own branding and the symbol was very refined and perfected. But this ain't that. Was it a new nautical Cobra symbol? Like the love child between the classic symbol and a bottom feeding fish? It's very finely tampoed. So fine, not much of it is left on my childhood one. He's got his widow's sting gauntlet. Which I totally imagined being a grapple hook launcher slash dart weapon as a child. All courtesy of being raised on comics, of course. And thankfully, a functional right hand. It's the small mercies. Southpaw is where things get a little more interesting. We've got an armband that is possibly merely decorative, but I'd like to think it's used for identification. On the card art, we see studs on the band. On the toy, we see no such studs. So this guy is stud enough. <laughs> no, seriously, if you're moving with your teammates and everyone is wearing identical uniforms, that could be the detail that denotes the team leader or your specific buddy diver. The left gauntlet is replete with three more studs, but I think they fulfill more crucial functions than merely identification. In an age before integrated dive computers telling you everything you need to know, I reckon these are separate instruments. One for depth, one for time, and a compass for heading. And now the hand. The glorious sculpted webbed hand which gave this guy so much character. People say it's non-functional. I disagree. 
Inspired by the inhumanly sharp talons of the file card, this was put to use as a very brutal hand-to-hand -hand weapon, slashing the throats of his enemies and making even an unequipped Hydra Viper a very efficient swimmer. No matter how you played it, the hand is a very visible representation of the file card information, that he is indeed surgically altered. Either that, or this is a glove. It could just be a glove. <laughs> I mean, do we assume his skin color becomes purple below the neck? His belt has a great sculpted detail picked out in red. Pouches! Presumably for dive weights. Now most weight belts don't use a pouch system, the weights are threaded onto the belt. A quick release buckle allows you to ditch your weights in case of an emergency ascent. But he can chuck out individual weights if he so desires. Then pop new ones in, presumably. Why he would do that is inexplicable, but it's cool that he has the option, I guess. He has a knife sheath on his right thigh and it's sculpted empty. I like this a lot. In an era before practical holsters and sheaths, having allowances for the included accessories to pretend store on the figure's sculpt was always great. It was true of version 2 Hawk, version 1 Destro, and very true of Hydra Viper. How the knife would sheath with its jagged barb is another question entirely. But it's a savage looking weapon and would definitely make a mess going in and total carnage coming back out. Seen here is Star Brigade Destro's knife because once again, mine never made it home on the day of purchase. The spear gun is also a brutal weapon. It's an upsize from the eel weapon and has a single massive tipped bolt in place of the double bolts from the original weapon. If we take a look at the card art again, the intended holster for this weapon is on Hydro's ankle. It would be pretty awkward to move about on shore or on board a craft, but once beneath the waves it should work out well enough. Just a bit of odd counterweight to his finning. The fins are organic in nature, a nice bit of continuity from the rather puckered texture we see on the top of his hood, but have the added detail of these claws. In my more Elseworlds gaming, these were poison tipped and delivered a nasty Rosa Kleb style lethal kick. Of course, maneuvering around with fins is awkward at the best of times when on dry land. But as functional flippers, these fulfill a double purpose of being both practical and bringing in the horror elements designed as a psychological warfare weapon. Plus, they look like nothing else in the line and certainly better than the reuse molds we see on so many other G.I. Joe and Cobra divers. Wetsuit, the eels, then we had eels version 2, undertow, and shipwreck version 2. Nobody bothered to reuse the Hydra Vipers. Nobody else could pull off this look. What's great is his booties continue the texture as well. Once again, the amount of synergy between accessory and figure sculpt is fantastic on this figure. A real masterclass in how to do it right. What does that leave us with? The animal inclusion, of course! It's a devil ray and possibly the most mystifying beast the line ever included. Has Cobra suddenly succeeded in weaponizing the devil ray? The Nintendo video game would have you believe so. In the Amazon level, the first level of the game, you encounter both Beast and Master and both are naturally trying to kill you. Hydro emerges and engages you with spear firing action, and Devil Rays sail out of the water and poisonous pools to deal damage to your player. Not only are they modified for ferocity, but they seem to thrive in liquids that would harm the Joe team. Aside from that precedent, the Devil Rays aren't worked into the few other appearances of the Hydro Viper. And this beast only found its way into my more otherworld storylines, and largely ignored when playing strictly G.I. Joe games. As far as media exposure beyond the video game goes, the Marvel US run of comics never gave Hydra Viper much panel time at all. When it comes to Hydra, Marvel UK is where it's at. Issue 14 of Action Force Monthly features a tale called War Beneath the Waves. Falcon has screwed up, again, and lost a vital MacGuffin. Cobra has it in an undersea base, and the big bad guarding it is none other than the demon of the deep himself, the Hydro Viper. James Bond style underwater action ensues. It is with some glee that Cobra Commander is name checking terrorist states who might have an interest in bidding for the MacGuffin, and he mentions Libya, and South Africa. 
In the late 80s, we were clearly still the bad guys. I like how this comic paints the Hydra Viper as a very serious threat, a major upgrade from the eels. And I also like how we see unmasked eels aplenty, showing the audience that these Cobra operatives are actually flesh and bone human beings. But Hydra's mask is never removed, even when he's not underwater. It adds to the mystery and speaks to the character's inhumanity. These elements are all present on the file card. It paints these guys as having undergone surgical procedures to better handle the perils of deep sea diving. They are more resistant to nitrogen narcosis, which is responsible for impaired judgment as a result of breathing compressed air at 100 meters or more. They've got webbed hands. They've even got a layer of surgically inserted blubber for natural insulation. Why bother? Just max out on the dreadnought diet of sugary deep fried treats and soda. Comfort food might at least have the side effect of combating some of the psychological side effects of these surgical alterations. According to the file card, Hydra Vipers don't have the greatest mental health. The last paragraph is pretty severe in painting these boys as a grim lot, like they've left their humanity behind. This had a huge impact on me when reading this as a child, further pushing Hydra Viper into the category of a misunderstood mutant who was ultimately the loneliest Cobra agent of all. So what are my closing thoughts on the Demon of the Deep and his devastating Devil Ray? He's still my favorite diver of all time, largely informed by my nostalgia for the figure, but enhanced by all the clever, practical, and fantastical touches. He's even got a great deal of added depth and sympathy from me, thanks to the excellent file card and rather tragic nature of the character. And above all else, he's the perfect marriage of science fiction and science horror in a three and three quarter inch plastic toy. I love him. Purple and all.